Are we really, as some people claim, in the middle of the sixth mass extinction? And are we seeing the insect apocalypse? We'll be diving deep into those questions in this video. My name is Malin Baker. This is The Malin Baker Show for Changemakers. OK, in this video, we're going to be looking at facts and evidence. But before we do that, I want to share with you something that I think is one of the most poignant sounds you will ever hear. What you're listening to is the Kaya Oo bird. It's believed that this recording was of the very last survivor before the species finally went extinct. This is a mating call. It's calling out to any possible mates that might be in the area. And it's a call that was never answered. I can't imagine anything much lonelier than the call of that single bird or anything more powerfully evocative of what we're going to talk about here. If we end up in this video casting doubt on some people's version of how much is happening and where, let's not lose sight of the fact that every species we lose is a tragedy and one that we should do everything we can to avoid. All right, species extinction has been heavily in the news in recent months. It started with the so-called insect apocalypse. The Guardian led the charge, as it always does, for the most alarming versions of this story. Plummeting insect numbers threaten collapse of nature, it cried. The world's insects are hurtling down the path to extinction. The best data suggests they could vanish within a century. The total mass of insects is falling by 2.5% a year. More than 40% of insect species are declining. You get the general idea. Now, the decline of insect populations is a cause for concern. You shouldn't make the mistake of thinking that because they're small, they don't matter. They're the food for birds and animals further up the food chain. They're pollinators, they recycle wastes, they perform all sorts of services of which we're blissfully unaware on a day-to-day -day basis. However, these headlines were not in line with the restrictions of the actual study that provoked them. Why not? Firstly, because the biggest feature about what we know about what's happening to the insect populations is that we know very little indeed. Given the huge number of insect species that exist, many of which we know are there but we haven't even discovered, we have data on tiny numbers. The study that provoked the headlines was very limited. They surveyed the existing literature with keyword searches, insect and decline and survey. And that might have seemed like a good idea, but it meant that it only turned up papers that talked about species showing a decline. Any papers with stable populations or increasing populations, or even just not using the word survey, would not have shown up in this search. It also won't have picked up papers with very specific species that might not have used the generic term insects. Now that's odd because the authors said that the aim of their study was, quote, to compile all long-term insect surveys conducted over the past 40 years that are available through global peer-reviewed literature databases. But their research methods didn't achieve that. First, for limited search strings. Second, they only searched one database, where generally good practice would have taken the search wider. As a result, it is not a systematic true meta-analysis, as the authors claim. Now, by the way, those are not my criticisms. I don't pretend to be well-versed enough in the scientific literature to come up with those observations. They are the observations of ecologists who specialise in the study of insects, such as Dr Manu Saunders. I include a link to her detailed critique in the notes below this video. The fact is that the results from that limited process left huge geographical and species gaps. It showed a decline in certain species, some species of moths and butterflies, some types of bees and beetles in parts of Western Europe, UK and North America. Most of the data from the rest of the world was incredibly sparse. The truth is that some species are declining, some are increasing. That doesn't mean the latter balances out the former, we just don't know. And with the habitats that are being destroyed, that seems unlikely. Two things we are able to safely say. First is that this was too limited a study to feed headlines about insect apocalypse. Second, no ecologist I've seen supports the contention that all insects will die out in 100 years. That's just not supported by the current data. Now, the most annoying thing about the whole exercise is that there is enough evidence to be concerned and to take action. 
but with various news sources and then consequentially campaign groups taking the screaming headlines and running with them rather than focusing on what we need to do, we're having to wade through alarmist nonsense to try to get to the facts. Because if you want to make things better, you need to be responding to the world as it is, not the way you think will scare more children and get their mothers to join your movement. Yes, Extinction Rebellion, I'm looking at you. Anyway, that was them. In the last couple of weeks, we've had a bigger report, making an even bigger splash. The UN IPBES body, which has done an extensive review of many different types of species and then launched a report on how big a hole we're in, feeding even more of a frenzy about the sixth mass extinction. I tuned into the live feed of the launch of this report because it was clearly going to be a big thing. The overwhelming response I had to what I saw was the sense of actually just how poorly communicated it was. The opening presentations gave no facts or figures from the report. They sort of assumed that we took it as read, that its conclusions were dire and we needed to change our wicked ways. The speeches were dull and self-indulgent, the data was absent. Then when you looked at what had been launched, it turned out that the 15,000 word report hadn't actually been launched at all just a summary for policymakers. Now that didn't stop the dramatic headlines and they focused on the big round number, one million species at risk of going extinct. And it sounds dramatic. It sounds like species are just dropping down around our ears like secondary characters in a Game of Thrones battle scene. And you know, whatever the exact numbers, there's no doubt that the impact we're having on large numbers of habitats is massively decreasing the amount of life on Earth. Remember, extinction just means there are zero left. But without tripping that definition, we can be seeing massive decreases in population. That's something we need to take seriously. Nevertheless, that one million figure has been bugging me. Because it's the kind of big figure that creates screaming panic headlines. And then it's the kind of figure that critics throw back at you a decade later when it didn't happen. Here are some of the headlines. Human society under urgent threat from loss of Earth's natural life. Nature crisis. Humans threaten one million species with extinction. Nature on the eve of destruction. Needless to say, such headlines have helped to fuel the extreme messages of groups like Extinction Rebellion, whose vehicle for radicalising young people is your children will die, because it all sounds pretty apocalyptic. But then you ask the question, well, how many species died last year? Because if this is a wave that is picking up speed, we're going to be seeing the devastation in front of our eyes. Well, in 2018, it's thought that three species of birds went extinct. That's not a lot. But then that's just one year, which might be unrepresentative. And of course, there are lots of species we've not yet discovered. So, of course, we don't know how many of those have gone. Nevertheless, three species that we do know about. Well, what about the last hundred years? Researchers suggested that since 1900, around 500 species have gone extinct. Well, it's hard to extrapolate from that 500 species to a million. So where does the one million figure come from? According to one of the report authors, it was extrapolated from the Red List of Endangered Species. The International Union for Conservation of Nature, who produce the Red List, have assessed to date 98,500 species, of which 27,000 are rated as threatened. Their target is to have 160,000 species rated by 2020. It's a great project, pretty robust, but one thing that would not be so robust would be simply to take the numbers, assume they're representative and scale them up. Why? After all, if you were doing public opinion research, you would kill for a sample size that large. Well, because animal species are very diverse and the habitats they depend on, spread across the world, are also very diverse and are facing challenges in very different ways. Plus, you'd have to ask certain questions like what process did they go through to select which species to assess? Were they chosen at random across geographies and species types? Or did they tend to focus on those where there were already signs that the species in question might be in trouble? Because if there's any element of the latter, then extrapolating the figures upwards would almost certainly end up overestimating. Now, the report author, Andy Purvis, has responded to several challenges over that one million figure by publishing an account of how the mathematics was done. They looked at the samples from the red list from the different taxonomic groups, but he said the average level of threat per group largely settled at around 25%, with the exception of insects, which is more difficult because there are just so many of them, vastly more species than any other group. 
So they looked at the data they did have for butterflies, bees and saprozoic beetles, specifically in Europe. Now, those had between 9 to 18% threatened, so they took a conservative estimate for all insects of an average of 10%. Out of 5.5 million insects, that gives half a million. They then took that average 25% figure for the other species, 25% of 2.5 million other animals and plants is half a million, or that's what he said anyway, 25% of 2.5 million is not half a million, 25% of 2 million would be half a million. But anyway, adding them together gives a million. And on that basis, you'd have to say that the million figure is really the broadest sweep estimate. Then there's another question about what endangered actually means. The red list uses a number of gradations of being at risk. The one million figure extrapolates from all the species that are in any of the endangered categories. Those are critically endangered, endangered and vulnerable. To qualify for vulnerable, you have to fulfil one of the following criteria. More than 50% decline in numbers in the last 10 years or three generations, reduction in the geographical range of the species, population size estimated to be fewer than 10,000 mature individuals with trends of continuing decline, analysis showing that probability of extinction in the wild at least 10% over 100 years. Now, it's absolutely right, the red list should be categorising species in that group for careful monitoring. But when people look at those screaming headlines, are they getting the message of 10% likelihood of extinction over 100 years? It's worth noting that the Atlantic cod is included in that list of vulnerable species. Now, cod has got its problems, but I don't think anyone believes it's going extinct anytime soon. Here's the graph that shows the estimated breakdown. One might argue it should promote serious reflection but possibly not headlines screaming panic. Sober reflection, because if you only pay attention to the red segments, it seems likely that the previous slower rate of extinction is going to ratchet up. And it's only because someone's been waving a big flag labelled one million under our noses that we might think that that smaller number is actually OK, which is part of the point, really. If somebody tells you that in the last century and a quarter, 500 species went extinct, but in the next, say, 50 years, that number is going to go up to 5,000. That would sound obviously bad. But if somebody tells you a million species are about to die and then it turns out to be 5,000 or even 50,000, well, suddenly that seems like a good news story. Now, the joker in this particular pack is that the author, Purvis, makes reference to a wholly independent second line of evidence using entirely separate data and analysis detailed in the chapter which supports this figure. However, for now, the report hasn't been published, so details of that line of evidence remain unexplained. I'm not sure why you wouldn't at least explain the short version of what that evidence is, but the fact that he didn't doesn't mean to say it doesn't exist or it might not be conclusive. I'm really reluctant in even talking about this because it would be so easy to characterise the analysis above as suggesting that everything's OK and we don't need to worry about species loss. Demonstrably, that's not the case. We are degrading habitats. This has had a big impact on ecosystem and species don't necessarily decline in gradual curves. You can see thresholds reach that lead to rapid collapse. We don't know where those thresholds are. And even where extinctions don't take place, it's important to note that numbers of flora and fauna can decline massively. So, for instance, if it turned out that 95% of pollinators disappeared tomorrow, which of course is not going to happen, but if it did, the fact those species hadn't technically become extinct would be of very small comfort as we try to find alternative way to pollinate essential crops. Campaigners will often say, we're in the middle of the sixth mass extinction in history. The first five that happened in prehistory were grim events. The first wiped out 70% of all species. The third did for as many as 96% of all species. We are clearly not in the middle of such an event as that today. We may be poised at the beginning of such an event, which can run over hundreds or thousands of years. But even taking the report headlines at face value, at 25% of all species, we would not exactly be in the same league as those previous events. But then avoiding the strict definition of a mass extinction event should not be our criteria for a good news story. So there is a lot of work to do. It doesn't feel as though the way that the issues are presented are always doing us favours. The fact that decision makers are not engaging as much with the messages as some would expect may partially be down to how those messages are being communicated.